Well, good morning and welcome to all of you from St Mary's and St James, as well as those of you who have joined us elsewhere for this service of Holy Communion on Palm Sunday. The music that forms part of our worship today is by David Thomas, our organist and the choir of St Mary's Sandersten. So we're going to begin this morning with the Liturgy of the Palms from the Garden of the Vicarage. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, during Lent we have been preparing by works of love and self-sacrifice for the celebration of our Lord's death and resurrection. Today we begin this solemn celebration in union with the church throughout the world. Christ enters his own city to complete his work as saviour, to suffer, to die and to rise again. So let us go with him in faith and love, so that united with him in his suffering, we may share in his risen life. So let us pray. God our Saviour, whose Son Jesus Christ entered into Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die. Let these palms be signs of his victory and grant that when we gather once more together, we may bear them in his name and ever hail him as our King, following him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. When they had come near Jerusalem and had entered Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them were following, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, saying, Who is this? The crowds went, saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. O God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let not the flood overwhelm me, nor the depth swallow me up. Let not the pit shut its mouth upon me. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Hear me, O Lord, as your loving kindness is good. Turn to me as your compassion is great. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. So let us pray for a closer union with Christ in his sufferings and in his glory. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. 
Our first reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, beginning at verse 4. The servant of the Lord said, The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backwards. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near, for who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The psalm today is Psalm 31. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, my soul and my body also. For my life is wasted with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of my affliction, and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies, and even to my neighbours an object of dread to my acquaintances. When they see me in the street, they flee from me. I am forgotten like one who is dead, out of mind. I have become like a broken vessel, for I have heard the whispering of the crowd, and fear is on every side. They scheme together against me, and they plot to take my life. But my trust is in you, O Lord, and I have said you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant and save me for your mercy's sake. Our second reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory be to you, O Lord. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marvelled greatly. At that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting in the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with him, this just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood is upon us 
and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when they had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted a crown of thorns and they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And then they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him upon the head. When they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now, as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. He they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mixed with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments amongst them, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put a sign over his head, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on his left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, You destroyed the temple, and you said you would build it in three days. Save yourself, if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and then we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the face of the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, The man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Leave him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I read a story of an event which happened during the 1978 fireman's strike. The army took over an emergency firefighting and on January the 14th they were called to the home of an elderly lady in South London to rescue her pet cat. They arrived with impressive haste and as they were about to leave, having retrieved the cat from the tree, the grateful lady invited them in for a cup of tea. Thanking her as they left, they reversed their truck, not realising that the cat was under it, and it killed it. It had all started off so very well. Josephus tells us that the population of Jerusalem grew tenfold during the great Passover feast, which means that there was probably well over a half a million people in the city on the day that Jesus rode through the gates. The sight and the sounds would have been tremendous. We heard in our reading that the crowds were waving palm branches as they welcomed Jesus, hence why we call today Palm Sunday. Waving palm branches, though, was a significant symbol during that time, but they weren't waving it because they had no flags. Two centuries before, Israel was in the hands of a ruthless and cruel ruler named Antiochus Epiphanes, and Antiochus had ransacked the Temple of Jerusalem and committed the most sacrilegious of acts. He sacrificed a pig on the altar. He placed images of Greek gods in the Holy of Holies and made slaves of the Jewish women. And after a bitter battle, the Jewish Maccabees conquered and retook Jerusalem. And as a symbol of their military victory, people waved palm branches. 
And so as Jesus enters into the gates of Jerusalem, the people wave their palms. But why on that day? What was their expectation? Roman historians tell us that Pontius Pilate also rode into Jerusalem at the same time. Hundreds of soldiers on horseback and on foot, clad in leather, polished to a high gloss. The centurions' helmets gleaming in the sun and swords crafted from the hardest metal to their sides. But Jesus enters Jerusalem from the opposite side as Pilate. And as he does so, he quotes from the prophecy of Zechariah that God will deliver the nation from the oppressor. Imagine then the, the sense of excitement and expectation of the people when they hear those words, knowing that Pontius Pilate's army is entering from the other side. But what started out really well was going to end in apparent failure. The people clearly had an expectation that Jesus was going to end the Roman occupation in a similar way to that of the Maccabees. But Jesus wasn't there to take Rome. He was there to take hearts. The occupation Jesus was going to end was that of sin and death. It was a time of great transition which would demand a response. The shouts of the crowds were welcoming a king. But before Jesus would take the throne, he would take the cross. It was a place of transition. Whenever we enter a place of transition, a time when God is about to do something new in us, there comes with it a time of trial, a time of doubt and uncertainty, a time when, if we are not careful, we can miss a God-given opportunity. And we are, I believe, in that sort of time now. There is, of course, much uncertainty at the moment. But will we, I wonder, take up this opportunity that is being given to us? Jesus, of course, could have stormed the city of Jerusalem with legions of angels, destroyed the Roman Empire with a word, and everyone from the least to the greatest would have hailed him as the Messiah of Israel. But Jesus' vision was not to save a few. His vision was to save the world. I read a story of a football coach who was reminiscing his childhood years in a league football team. His coach had called together the whole team for a picnic, and he asked them, who here wants to play professional football? And every child put up their hand, as every child there dreamed of being a footballer. He grew up and then himself became a football coach. And one day he asked his children the same question. Who, when they want to grow up, wants to become a professional footballer? But none of them put up their hands, because none of them believed that they had what it took. Believing God's promises for us and understanding his vision for our lives may be one of the hardest things that we do, but in many ways it is the most important. It is hard because it takes practice to be in the presence of God. Vision is that thing that enables a dream for the future. And vision has been called hope without a blueprint. A vision is what an inventor has when they think outside of the box to create something that no one else has. Vision is what a mother sees when she looks at her new baby and imagines all that they will grow up to become. Thomas Watson, the chairman of IBM, said in 1943, I think that there may be a market for about five computers in the world. In 1977, Ken Olson said, there's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their own home. In 1876, a memo was sent saying that the telephone has far too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Or take the words of the Decca Record Company, who when they turned down the Beatles in 1962 said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on its way out. The scriptures tell us that for lack of vision, my people perish. As Jesus makes his way into Jerusalem, it was vision that kept him on track. He knew what God had called him to do, and he set his mind and will to do it. Even though people did not understand at the time what was happening, and I guess at this time we might feel the same. 
A fortune teller, gazing into her crystal ball, said to the frog who sat before her, You are going to meet a beautiful young woman. From the moment she sets her eyes on you, she will have an insatiable desire to be near to you, for you will fascinate her. Wow, that's amazing, said the frog. Where am I, in a singles club? No, the fortune teller said, you're in a biology class. The hardest thing for a Christian to do is to stand in their faith when life fails to meet expectation, when what we think is going to happen doesn't. Palm Sunday is, of course, easy. The crowds are there, the atmosphere is there, the celebration is there. Jesus is here to rescue us. Our problems are over. Or so they thought. The reality was, though, Jesus wasn't going to destroy the Roman Empire. In fact, 35 years after Jesus' death, the Temple of Jerusalem was burnt to the ground. 1.1 million Jews were dead and Israel ceased to be their national homeland until 1948. As Jesus entered the gates of Jerusalem, he was leading his people into transition and it wasn't going to be easy. And following Jesus today is also not always easy. It often means sacrifice. It sometimes means disappointment and it always means staying the course. It means confronting our own hearts and attitudes and doing something about them. It means loving one another when actually we might not even like each other. It means risking ourselves to the world out there so that they might discover the reality of God in here. The Christian life is easy when things are going well, when we are one of the in crowd or when the atmosphere at home is good and when our vision is going according to the plan we have. But life's not always like that, is it? We sometimes go through times when our vision fades, its passions begin to ease and its heat becomes cold. It is then that we need to press in, to remember the goodness of God in the past and to seek his will for the future. Sometimes we experience times of sadness and disappointment. Times when we feel as if our prayers are hitting that never-ending ceiling. We will, I'm sure, all be able to identify with the fact that Jesus doesn't always appear in the way that we expect or might like. Just as the crowd did on that first Palm Sunday in AD 33, when they expected him to defeat the Romans and to restore Israel to its former glory. But Jesus didn't do that. He went the way of the cross. The Bible is full of people who fell away when their expectations weren't met. Elijah ran away and hid in a cave. Jeremiah got mad and he said he wasn't going to preach anymore. And the disciples all ran away and went back to fishing. But no matter what our experience is, we must hold on to the fact that God has a purpose for us and that if we submit to him, he will help us achieve that purpose. As I said, in AD 70, the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed, fulfilling Jesus' prophecy that not one stone of it would remain upon another. And the whole of Jerusalem was laid waste, but the Christians all escaped, because we read in Matthew 24 that Jesus had told his disciples that when they saw certain signs that they were to flee Judea and to go to the mountains, and we know that they did that, and not one of them died. It's sometimes difficult for us to see the bigger picture, and we struggle to connect God's truth with what's going on in our lives. Jesus was willing to disappoint everyone except his Father in heaven. Jesus loved his followers enough to disappoint them, to allow them to question his decisions and his actions, and to struggle with their own expectations. And he will, at times, disappoint ours too, in order to for help us to fulfil God's purposes. But if we listen, he will lead us through and direct us to a safe place. The way of the cross is the way of sacrifice, and it is often a way of pain, but it is always the way to life. I'm going to close with one final story. 
On February the 6th, 1989, the lives of George and Vera Bajenski were changed forever. It was a normal Thursday when the phone rang at 9.15 in the morning. There had been an accident involving their son, Ben. As they approached the crossroads, they could see the flashing lights of the police cars and ambulance. Vera noticed a photographer and followed the direction of his camera lens to the largest pool of blood that she had ever seen. All she could say was, George, Ben has gone home to be with his heavenly father. Her first reaction was to jump out of the car and to somehow collect the blood and put it back into her son. The blood was, she said, the most precious thing in the world because it was life. It was the life-giving blood of my son and it belonged to him. The road was dirty and it did not belong there. George noticed that cars were driving right through the crossroads, right through his son's blood, and his heart was broken. He wanted to cover the blood with his own coat and cry out, you will not drive through the blood of my son. Then Vera understood for the very first time in her life, one of the greatest and most beautiful truths, why the blood of Jesus? Because it was the strongest language God could have used. It was the most precious thing he had to give, the highest price he could ever pay. Our Lenten journey does not stop with Lent 5, nor does our need to accept God's invitation to enter a new place of transition. To seek for this vision of God and the purpose that he has for our lives, and to press on even when our expectations are dashed. Amen. We say together the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. With shouts of joy and jubilation, the crowd announce your triumphal entry to the city. On this day, fill your church with these praises and keep us steadfast in times of trouble and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With shouts of anger and hatred, the crowd called for your death. Strengthen the hands of all who lead not to abuse their power. Preserve us from injustice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With shouts of horror and defiance, your disciples swore allegiance and loyalty. Give courage to all whose fatality is tested against popularity. Save us from betrayal and deceit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With shouts of anguish and terror, frightened friends looked on powerless and impotent. Be with all who stare into the darkness of fear and anxiety. Shine the light of your hope to illuminate the shadows of despair. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With shouts of grief and desolation, your mother and closest companions received your lifeless body. Be alongside all who weep over the loss of a loved one. We pray especially today for Margaret de Souza. Bring us all to the joy that comes with the first light of your new day. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Once we were far off, but now in union with Christ we have been brought near through the shedding of Christ's blood. For he is our peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. With this bread that we bring, we shall remember Jesus. With this wine that we bring, we shall remember Jesus. Bread for his body, wine for his blood, gifts from God to his table we bring. We shall remember Jesus. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For at this time of his passion and resurrection draws near, the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden majesty, the power of the life-giving cross reveals the judgment that has come upon the world and the triumph of Christ crucified. He is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever, our advocate in heaven to plead our cause, exalting us there to join with angels and archangels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, 
God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. And so as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace.
Lord Jesus Christ. You humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant and in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the minds to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. Amen. May the Father who so loved the world that he gave his only Son bring you by faith to his eternal life. May Christ who accepted the cup of sacrifice in obedience to the Father's will keep you steadfast as you walk with him on the way of the cross. And may the Spirit who strengthens us to suffer with Christ that we may share his glory set your minds on life and peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those you love always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we enter this Holy Week, I hope that you will continue to join us on Monday and Tuesday for morning prayer at 10 a.m. and then on Wednesday for Stations of the Cross. On Thursday at six o'clock we will share together the liturgy of the institution of the Lord's Supper and then at two o'clock on Good Friday when we remember the Lord's death in the liturgy of the day. So may God bless you.